You're listening to Gullum Institute's podcast series, Sira, Life of the Prophet, by Sheikh Abdul Nasir Jangda. Visit us on the web at gullaminstitute.org or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash gullaminstitute. Bismillahi walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi. <clears throat> وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. So alhamdulillah after a couple of weeks uh, off we're uh, back here again with the lecture on the life of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم أسيرة نبوية. We kind of left off in the middle of a an event from the life of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم which was the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم's journey to the city of Ta'if. And we, I believe, spoke about the journey to the city of Ta'if uh, for a couple of sessions because it is such a profound incident, such a, an important event from the life of the Prophet ﷺ. And as I've mentioned numerous times, uh, one of the tragedies about how we study the life of the Prophet ﷺ is a lot of times it's just studied just to kind of know uh, a sequence of events, almost like a timeline. Whereas the true purpose of studying the Qur'an or studying the life of the Prophet ﷺ or the words of the Prophet ﷺ, the sunnah, the seerah, is to actually be able to extract relevant practical lessons and wisdom from it so that we have some direction and some purpose in our in our own lives and so we've been talking about the journey to Ta'if uh, for a couple of sessions now, we talked about why did the Prophet ﷺ even entertain the idea of journeying to Ta'if and visiting the people, the community in Ta'if. We talked about the Prophet ﷺ's arrival in Ta'if and the strategy that he employed in order to approach the people of Ta'if and share the message of Islam with them. We also talked about how the Prophet Sallallahu message, what response did it receive? And how was he met with, um, in, in terms of the people of Ta'if, and how did they respond and react to the message of the Prophet Sallallahu And then of course we talked about how he exited from Ta'if and the very brutal treatment that he, reser- that he received from the people of Ta'if at the hands of the people of Ta'if. And of course the dua and the supplication of the Prophet Sallallahu not only turning to to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but specifically praying for the guidance of the people of Ta'if or their future generations. And also we talked about what the consequence of that dua of the Prophet ﷺ was. In the last session that we had, we talked about once they finally left him, and the Prophet ﷺ utilized that opportunity to make dua for them and to turn to Allah and seek comfort and solace with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We also talked about how the Prophet ﷺ interacted with a slave uh, there in the garden of Utbah and uh, Rabi'ah, the sons of Sheba. And uh, this was a Christian man, a Christian slave by the name of Addas. And the Prophet ﷺ gave him, you know, da'wah, shared the message of Islam with with him and he ends up accepting Islam. What occurred now is of course the Prophet ﷺ after he recovered there at Qadnul Manazil or some of the books of Sirah refer to it as Qadnul Tha'alib there in the garden owned by the sons of uh, Rabi'ah then now the Prophet ﷺ started to make his way back to Mecca. He started to make his way back to Mecca and again it is him and his servant and also who is a believer, Zayd bin Haritha radiallahu anhu, and they are now journeying their way back to Mecca. On their way back to Mecca, the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, there's a very brief incident that Ibn Ishaq mentions this incident, Ibn Kathir has also mentioned it. There's a very brief incident that the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam stopped at and camped at a place um, called Nakhla. This was a place um, shortly, uh, very, you know, very immediately outside of Mecca. And of course, there, the Prophet ﷺ camped at this place, Nakhla, and we'll talk about why did he exactly camp there and what was his reason and his purpose for not just going straight into Mecca. Why would he stop a little bit outside of Mecca? But something very interesting happened here. So when the Prophet ﷺ stopped here, of course it was evening time, it was night time. 
The Prophet ﷺ utilized this opportunity to make dua, to pray to Allah, to offer nawafil, to pray salah, and recite Qur'an like as in qiyam prayers, tahajjud prayers. He utilized this opportunity to do so. And so the Prophet of Allah ﷺ was there, they're camped out there, and the Prophet ﷺ is offering the night prayers, the qiyam prayers, and reciting the Qur'an. While the Prophet ﷺ is reciting the Qur'an in these night prayers, the narration mentions that some jinn who are passing through there. And the Qur'an talks about this as well in Surah Al-Ahqaf. In Surah Al-Ahqaf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this, um, Surah number 46, ayah number 29, Allah says, وَإِذْ صَرَفْنَا إِلَيْكَ نَفَرًا مِنَ الْجِنِّ that when a group of the jinn, they came around and they, basically they turned around, they came around to you. So they were passing by there, they were passing through there, and they heard the Prophet ﷺ reciting the Qur'an. And it was so captivating, it was so attention grabbing, that they turned their direction and they came up to the Prophet ﷺ. يَسْتَمِعُونَ Quran. What were they doing? They started very intensely listening, listening to the Qur'an. And the word that's used is nafaran. A group of the jinn. One of the narrations, one of the hadith here mentions that there were seven jinn that were passing through here. And when they heard the Prophet ﷺ reciting the Qur'an, they stopped and they came over close to the Prophet ﷺ, yastami'oon al-Qur'an. They were very intently listening to the Prophet ﷺ recite the Qur'an. فَلَمَّا حَضَرُوهُ When they got close to the Prophet ﷺ, and حَضَرُوهُ means when they came into his presence. That means they came very close to the Prophet Sallallahu Some of them must have been talking and saying, why are we here? Why did we stop? Why are we changing direction? That's not where we, where we were going. A couple of the jinn told the, the rest of the group that was traveling, Ansitu, be quiet, be quiet. Meaning listen. Insat isn't just simply to be quiet. Uskutu is like be quiet. Stop talking. Ansitu means to be quiet and to listen. To become quiet in order to listen to something. So they said, Ansitu. This is why Allah says in the Quran, إِذَا قُرِئَ الْقُرْآنُ فَإِذَا قُرِئَ الْقُرْآنُ فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ وَأَنصِتُوا That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when the Quran is being read, then listen very carefully and be quiet so that you can hear the Quran. Because you can't hear it if you're talking over it. So this is the command to us as well. And very interestingly, what does Allah say? What will be the outcome if you listen to it carefully and you don't talk over it and you be quiet and listen to the Qur'an being recited? What is the outcome of that? لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ So that maybe you may receive mercy. Possibly, hopefully, you can be the recipients of mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the Qur'an is the channel, the medium of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delivering mercy to us. That's why the opening of every surah in the Qur'an is Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. It's because it opens the doors of mercy. So they said, Ansitu, they said, be quiet, listen. فَلَمَّا قُضِيَ When the recitation of the Qur'an was completed, when the Prophet ﷺ was done reciting the Qur'an in his prayer, وَلَّوْا إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِمْ مُنْذِرِينَ They turned back to their people, but now something had changed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they didn't just turn back to their people. They went back to their people, they turned back to their people, meaning the rest of their tribe, the tribe of the jinn. Mundirin. But now they went back to their people as, you know, warners. People who were carrying a message. We're going back to remind their people. Qalu, what did they say? Allah tells us in the next ayah, ayah number 30. Ya qawmana, they said our people, inna sami'na kitaban. We have heard a book, Unzila min ba'di Musa, a book that has been sent down after Musa alayhi salam, Musaddiqan lima bayna yaday. And it is affirming everything that came before this book. This book, this scripture that we have heard, that we have listened to, it is affirming all the previous revelations and scriptures. Yahdi ila al haq. It guides to the truth, to a solid foundation. وَإِلَىٰ طَرِيقٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ And it guides to a straight path. So what's very interesting is that they're saying it not only guides to a solid foundation in theory, but it guides to that solid foundation, that truth, practically as well. It provides a very practical 
direction in which a person can live their life. Ya qawmana ajibu da'i Allah. They said our people, answer to the one who is calling you to Allah. What's very interesting about their construction, and this is a profound lesson of how they understood the message of the Qur'an. They didn't just say, ajibu da'wat Allah, answer the call of Allah. They said, ajibu da'i Allah. Answer and respond to the one. Da'i is a person. Da'i is the caller. Da'i Allah, the caller of Allah. So we see that people who took the Qur'an from the Prophet ﷺ did not separate the Prophet ﷺ from the Qur'an. They didn't understand these two things to be separate and independent of each other. And that does not compromise the sanctity of the Qur'an in any way, shape or form. Absolutely not. The Qur'an and the Sunnah are two separate sources of our religion. However, while being separate sources of our religion, they are not independent of one another. There's a difference here. There's a distinction. There's a clear distinction between what is Qur'an and what is Sunnah. But at the same time, there is this deep-rooted, solid understanding that they are still connected to one another and inseparable from one another. And so when they go back to their people delivering the message of the Qur'an to them, they don't just simply tell their people that answer this call of God or listen to this word of God. They say, go and answer and respond to and embrace the message being delivered to you from this man who is calling you to God, who is calling you to Allah. And yes, he recites these words of Allah, but he himself is the bearer of this message. And if you want to understand this message properly, you must go to this man. And similarly, this is our purpose and our reason for studying the life of the Prophet ﷺ here. This does not supersede, nor does this depart from studying the Qur'an or the message of the Qur'an, but rather it complements, supports, and enhances our study of the Qur'an. It solidifies our studying of the message of the Qur'an. And that's something that they understood here. The people who took the Qur'an from the Prophet ﷺ, whether they were human or jinn, understood this reality and this fact. And this is a reality and a fact that we have to go back to as the ummah of the Prophet ﷺ. As people who believe, embrace the Qur'an, we have to go back to this philosophy. So anyways, they say, Ya qawmana ajibu da'i Allah. Our people, they say, O oh, our people, answer, respond to, basically, in, in the Arabic language, answering and responding, ijaba means respond and answer positively. Embrace the message of this man who calls you to Allah. وَآمِنُوا bihi, And then believe in him. Believe in him. يَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ مِنْ ذُنُوبِكُمْ Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive your sins. وَيُجِرْكُمْ مِنْ عَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ And he will protect you from a very painful punishment, a very tormenting punishment. So he will forgive your sins in this world, in this life, and in the hereafter, he will protect you, yujirkum, he will grant you his protection. The word that's used as well for protection, it, that is a word that was used for someone granting someone else their protection. This is very beautiful. It's actually very interesting that this word is used here. Because there are other words that are used for protection from the punishment. There is yunjikum and najat is also used in the Qur'an, in the Arabic language for protection from punishment. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here uses the word yujirkum, ajara yujiru, which means, which means to grant protection. And what would happen in olden times is that when you would go somewhere or you would enter a town or you maybe had some type of a quarrel or a disagreement, some person in a position of power and influence would grant you his protection and you would be under the protection of that person and harming you or encroaching upon you was not just simply that person now advancing towards you, it was that person declaring war against the person who had granted you his or her protection. So saying that Allah will grant you his protection means that then coming against you, rising against you, laying a finger on you will be declaring war against Allah himself. And why this word is used here in this context, we'll talk about in just a little bit. وَمَنْ لَا يُجِبَ دَاعِيَ اللَّهِ And whosoever will not answer, will not respond to 
the one who is calling you to Allah, the Messenger of Allah, فَلَيْسَ بِمُعْجِزٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ then he is not causing any harm to Allah nor his messenger on this earth. وَلَيْسَ لَهُ مِن دُونِهِ أَوْلِيَا And he will not have other than Allah, aside from Allah, he will not have any supporters, anyone. Nobody will be there to support him other than Allah. أُولَٰئِكَ فِي ضَلَالِ مُبِينَ Those people are clearly immersed in drowning in clear misguidance, grave error. So these are the ayat that were revealed. One of the things that some of the mufassirun and the muhaddithun and the scholars of Sirah comment, specifically the mufassirun have commented under the tafsir of this ayah, that the understanding of the earliest generations, even the sahaba radiallahu anhum, was that when these jinn came, heard the message of the Prophet uh, heard the Prophet reciting the Qur'an, they did not interact with the Prophet ﷺ at this point. They didn't interact with him. They just went from there, took the message of the Qur'an back to the rest of their tribe, a tribe of the jinn, and started teaching and spreading and talking about this message and the Qur'an and this messenger of Allah to the rest of their tribe. And later on, and we'll be talking about this later on in the seerah, later on, the Prophet ﷺ would actually go outside of Mecca with some of the Sahaba, some of the companions, and then actually go there to dialogue with the jinn. And that would be the revelation of the surah that we know as Suratul Jinn. قُلْ أُوحِيَ إِلَيَّ أَنَّهُ اسْتَمَعَ نَفَرٌ مِّنَ الْجِنْ فَقَالُوا إِنَّا سَمِعْنَا قُرْآنًا عَجَبًا يَهْدِي إِلَى الرُّشْتِ فَآمَنَّا بِهِ وَلَنْ نُشِكَ بِرَبِّنَا حدا. And then the surah goes on from there that tell them, قُلْ say, Like the, Allah tells the Prophet ﷺ, you're about to go talk to a group of jinn, a tribe of the jinn. What? So of course the Prophet ﷺ is wondering, how do you dialogue with the jinn? What am I supposed to say to them? And Allah tells the Prophet ﷺ that you tell them, أُوحِيَ ilayya. It was revealed to me, it was divinely inspired to me, I was informed by God Almighty. أَنَّهُ إِسْتَمَعَ نَفَرٌ مِّنَ الْجِنْ that a group of the jinn had heard the Qur'an, had very intensely listened to and paid attention to the Qur'an. فَقَالُوا إِنَّا سَمِعْنَا قُرْآنًا عَجَبًا And they said, we heard a Qur'an that is truly remarkable, mind-blowing. The word ajaba is like what we would call in our language, mind-blowing. يَهْدِي إِلَى الرُّشْدِ It guides to a very noble way of living life. فَأَمَنَّا بِهِ So we believed in it. وَلَنْ نُشِكَ بِرَبِّنَا حَدَى And we don't associate any partners to our Lord and our Master. And then it goes on from there. That that conversation would take place at a later time. But the Prophet ﷺ, so even though they didn't interact with the Prophet ﷺ at this time, the Prophet ﷺ, Allah knows best if he actually was even aware of the fact that they came and they listened to the Prophet ﷺ reciting the Qur'an in his Qiyam prayers. But... What we do know is that it was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ, وَإِذْ صَرَفْنَا إِلَيْكَ نَفَرًا مِّنَ الْجِنِّ نَفَرٌ مِّنَ الْجِنِّ That a group of the jinn came to you. They came to you and they heard you reciting the Qur'an. So this was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ after the Prophet ﷺ must have been done reciting his prayers and Allah sent this divine revelation to the Prophet ﷺ that you had some visitors tonight. Some very interesting visitors. A group of the jinn visited you. And they heard you reading the Qur'an. And they've gone back to their people. And this is the message that they delivered to their people. So now the Prophet ﷺ was cognizant of this. He was conscious of the fact. He knew of, of the fact. Certainly, without a doubt, because it's Qur'an. He knew that jinn had come, heard the Qur'an, taken this message back to their own tribe. And now from there the conversation will continue. It's to be continued. And that story would pick up and continue later on when the Prophet ﷺ later on in, the, in Mecca would actually go out to Ukav, which was right outside of Mecca where a major marketplace and some festivals and carnivals and things like that would occur during the year. There were annual festivities and carnivals that would take place there. So the Prophet ﷺ would go out to this place at a time of the year, at a time when there weren't any festivities taking place. So it was kind of like an in-between place. There was some structure there, and people were familiar with this place, but there was no one there right now. So it's almost like, you know, like a picnic area. 
outside of you know the, the, the town, outside of the city. And the Prophet went out there with some of the Sahaba, and there a meeting was arranged and took place between the Prophet and a tribe of the jinn. And then the conversation will continue as Suratul Jinn informs us. And it's very fascinating. So when we get there, we'll actually read through Suratul Jinn and see what some of the conversation were and what some of the facts that were learned by both sides. The jinn got to know more about Islam, got to know more about Allah, got to know more about the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But at the same time, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam got to know more about this creation, this makhluk, this creation of Allah called the jinn. But... This story that will be continued later started here. Why am I mentioning here? Because it took place here in the chronology of events. But now we can dig a little bit deeper. See the whole purpose and our maqsad, our purpose of studying this is to learn something from it. Not to just know that this took place, but what do we learn from it? So we have to dig a little deeper. We have to peel some of the layers back to actually understand. Now when we dig a little deeper and try to understand it in the context of events that happen, it's very interesting and very profound. You gotta understand what just happened with the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ has been in Mecca for 10 years. Preaching and teaching the message of Islam tirelessly. Non-stop. Non-stop. He's been preaching and teaching. And there have been people who have believed, a couple of hundred people, but for the, the vast majority of his people, his own people in Mecca do not believe. And in fact oppose him. And it's very difficult. After 10 years it takes a toll on him. And then after losing his two strongest supporters, and two people who are probably the most important people to him personally in his life, his beloved wife Khadija of 25 years, and his uncle Abu Talib who raised him from the age of 8. This man has been a part of his life now, for his entire life of 50 years, because he was his uncle, but for 42 years, he's been the main person in his life. He's his uncle, the man who raised him. And so the Prophet says, after dealing with all of this, he goes to the next largest city in Arabia, At-Ta'if. There he goes to talk to this, the second largest tribe in Arabia, Thaqif, only to again be met with Ridicule, rejection, opposition. And they go ahead and do something that the people of Mecca have never done. And that is they brutally, mercilessly, viciously attack the Prophet ﷺ. You, you, you see, you have to understand one thing. There's nobody that can ever say or ever claim that the Prophet ﷺ's faith or his conviction was ever shaken. That's impossible. He's Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi He receives divine revelation. He talks, he communicates with Allah directly. Allah communicates with him directly. There's no doubting the fact that he had full 100% conviction. As much as he did in the cave of Hira on the day that the revelation was given to him. Unshakable faith. But you still have to understand that he was a human being and it was just, it was taking a toll on him. Emotionally, physically, it was taking a toll on him. As Allah mentions in the Quran, You will destroy yourself based on the fact that these people don't believe. So it was taking a toll on him. And he needed, he required some type of just human support or, or any type of support. Everybody needs that. Surah Yaseen, I've, I've referenced this earlier. Surah Yaseen talks about this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet you have to warn them. You have to warn them. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet that Allah tells the Prophet that the majority, a lot of these people will not believe whether you warn them or you don't. They're not going to believe. But then Allah does tell the Prophet that there will be some people that believe in you and they heed the warning, they follow the reminder and they believe in the unseen. 
They fear Allah even though even when they are alone. They think of Allah, they're aware of Allah, they're conscious of Allah. And the reason why that was so important is that as at a very human level, we all need from time to time, we all need a, a win. We all need some type of a, a, a release, a reprieve from the constant you know, difficulty that we might be facing. There have to be moments in there of rest, of comfort, of, of, of just getting some type of a, a win from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the Prophet ﷺ is disappointed by humans. Think about this. He's disappointed by the largest city, the largest tribe in Mecca. Then he goes to the second largest city, the second largest tribe in Ta'if, and he's disappointed by them there. And so the Prophet ﷺ is on his way back. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends him a group of jinn who hear the Qur'an and instantly believe in the message. So much so, think about how much of an impact the message had on them that they didn't just go back and say, we believe in this. They go back, mundirin. They believe in this so strongly, with so much conviction that they go back to deliver this message to, to their own people. They go back as warners, warning their own, their own tribe, saying that we've received a profound message that we believe in, and now you need to believe in it as well. They are now advocates of the Prophet They are now delivering this message on his behalf to the rest of their tribe. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala divinely inspires this to the Prophet to remind him, to let him know, even though he had no doubts. But like Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he made dua to Allah, that I want to see how you revive the dead. And Allah, Allah tell them, I absolutely believe, Ya Allah. There's no doubt. There's no question of me doubting my faith or my iman. But I need some peace and tranquility. I need some comfort. I need some rest. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides peace and comfort. That there is a khalq, there is a makhluq, there is a creation of Allah. Other than the human being. And this message that you have is so profound and such a reality that you're busy delivering this message to human beings, but your efforts are not in vain. You went there, you delivered the message. The people of Ta'if did not believe. You made dua for them after everything they did to you. But guess what? Even if they didn't believe, someone else did. A group of jinn believed. Something you couldn't have even expected. What were the Prophet's expectations when he went to Ta'if? That they'll accept the message, they'll believe, or maybe some people will believe at the most? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him something he, he couldn't have even expected. A group of jinn passing by will listen to you reciting Qur'an in your prayer and believe and go back and start preaching and teaching the message of Islam in their own, amongst their own? You couldn't even imagine that. And this is exactly, this is like a practical manifestation that when we do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us to do, when we stick to Allah, to the task that Allah has given to us, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us things that we couldn't even imagine, we couldn't even expect it. As the ayah of the Qur'an tells us in Surah, in surah Al-Talaq, Allah will make a way for somebody who, who maintains their cognizance, their faith, their belief in Allah. And what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? Allah will provide for that person something that is beneficial to that person from where that person can't even imagine. وَمَنْ يَتَوَكَّلَ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُهُ As long as somebody maintains their trust and their faith in Allah, their dependence upon Allah, Allah will suffice for that person. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided for the Prophet ﷺ in a way, from a place that couldn't even been expected by any of us. Where these jinn accepted Islam. So now, the Prophet ﷺ is there, camped outside of Mecca, but he's not going into Mecca. And there's a reason for that. The Prophet of Allah 
Some of the narrations tell us that some of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, some of the you know, believers, some of the followers of the Prophet sallallahu received news that he was camped outside of Mecca and they actually met him or maybe they were already awaiting his return and they met him, they received him outside of Mecca. And so either the Prophet ﷺ already had an idea that, he, that it wasn't smart for him to just waltz right back into Mecca because maybe they were waiting, maybe they were gonna seize this as an opportunity to do something very drastic to the Prophet ﷺ or some of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum received the Prophet kind of stopped him outside of Mecca and said, don't come back into Mecca. Because the situation has deteriorated since you left. They've launched a whole campaign that you've gone outside of Mecca to recruit people, to launch an, uh, an attack against Mecca. And they've been able to raise up quite a bit of support against you now, to take extreme drastic measures against you. So it's not safe for you to come back in. So the Prophet ﷺ said, okay, that makes sense. We need to kind of have a strategy in terms of how we re-enter Mecca. So one of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, Abdullah bin Uraiqit, the Prophet ﷺ, who was a little bit you know, familiar with diplomacy and politics in Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ sent him to Al-Akhnas bin Shuraiq who was one of the leaders of Quraysh, had been one of the primary opponents of the Prophet ﷺ, but he was also one of those three individuals that we talked about a few sessions back, that used to go at night to listen to the Prophet ﷺ, recite the Qur'an in his qiyam, in his night prayers. So the Prophet ﷺ having some idea that Akhnas bin Shuraiq has some internal conflict, some doubts about his opposition against the Prophet ﷺ. The Qur'an has made an impact on this man. The Prophet ﷺ sent his, his you know, uh, representative, if you will. The Prophet ﷺ sent his messenger, his representative, to Akhnas bin Shuraiq, that go and ask him, inquire from him, if he will grant me his protection. Remember that word I was talking about that Allah used in the Qur'an in Surah Ahqaf? Yujirkum ajara yujiru to grant protection. Will he grant his ijara? His protection. Akhnas bin Shuraiq said, No, I'm sorry, I can't. Look, the situation in Makkah is really bad. I really can't help. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Okay, Abdullah bin Uraiqit comes back with this news that He's not willing to grant any type of protection or vouch for you. So now the Prophet ﷺ sends Abdullah bin Uraiqi to Suhail bin Amr. Suhail bin Amr, whose son would later on actually accept Islam. Or at this time, had, or no, he would later on accept Islam. So he, he's another leader of Quraysh. So he sends him to Suhail bin Amr. Suhail bin Amr, by the way, was also one of the individuals who came at the time of Sulu Hudaybiyah. We'll be talking about this later. But he was one of the individuals who came on behalf of Quraysh, on behalf of the Meccans, to negotiate the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. So he was a respected man in Mecca, amongst the Quraysh. So the Prophet ﷺ sends Abdullah bin Uraiqit, well, that will he vouch for the Prophet ﷺ so he can enter back into Mecca peacefully. We don't want any trouble. So Hail bin Amr says that, I can't help you either. This is a Banu Hashim issue, I'm Banu Amir, etc., etc., some type of bogus excuse. And he backs out of it, he says, I can't. So Abdullah bin Uraiqid comes back to the Prophet ﷺ that Suhail bin Amr is not willing to be a part of this either. So finally the Prophet ﷺ sends Abdullah bin Uraiqid to Mut'im bin Adi. This is another leader of Quraysh. Now the reason why the Prophet ﷺ sends him to Mut'im bin Adi, so he sent him to Akhnas bin Shuraiq because the Prophet ﷺ had the, you know, had basically an idea that Akhnas has considered Islam in the past, he sent him to Suhail bin Amr because Suhail bin Amr was a very pragmatic individual. That's why he came to you know, negotiate Hudaybiyah a decade later. But now the Prophet ﷺ sends Abdullah bin Uraiqit, 
his delegate, he sends him to Mutim bin Adi. Who is Mutim bin Adi? His name has come up in our discussion on the seerah before. Mutim bin Adi was actually the man who had kind of supported Abu Talib and gained a lot of support in order to do away with, to end the boycott of the Prophet ﷺ, Banu Hashim, and anyone and everyone who believed in or supported the Prophet ﷺ for those three years of the boycott in the Shu'ab of Abi Talib. That agreement that Abu Jahl had drafted, that all the rest of the leaders of Quraysh had been a part of, had signed off on. Mutim bin Adi was actually the one that went around, gained some support, came to the Kaaba, to the Haram, and actually then said, we need to end this now. We've had enough. And he was in contact with Abu Talib that I'm trying to make this stop. So the Prophet ﷺ knew, Mutim bin Adi is, had not believed in the message, was not a Muslim, had no you know, interest in accepting Islam, but the Prophet ﷺ knew that he was a man who had some principles, some morals, some ethics. He got fed up with the fact that their own people were being ostracized and boycotted and were suffering in this manner. And so he had actually stood for the well-being of the Muslims in the past. And the Prophet ﷺ, having knowledge of this fact, sends his representative, go talk to Mutar bin Adi. When Mutar bin Adi hears, he says, Naam kullahu falyati. He tells him, "Yes, I'm in." Now go tell Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that he can come. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam comes with Zayd bin Haritha into Mecca, and they go straight to the house of Muntah bin Adi. And the narration actually mentions, "Fadhaba ilayhi Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, fabata indahu tilka layla." The Prophet ﷺ even stayed a night in the house of Mutim bin Adi. So that means they came in, they snuck in at night. Mutim bin Adi received them at his home and kept him in his home as his own guest. The following day, فَلَمَا أَصْبَحَ خَرَجَ مَعَهُ هُوَ وَبَنُوهُ سِتَّةٌ أَوْ سَبَعَةٌ مُتَقَلِّدِي السُّيُوفَ جَمِيعًا The next morning, they leave the home of Mutim bin Adi and the six or seven sons of Mutim bin Adi are with him and the Prophet So it's the Prophet Mutim bin Adi and his seven sons. All of them have taken their swords, have basically strapped themselves up. So they're all packing heat. And they all go out and they go to the Haram, they go to the Kaaba. فَدَخَلُوا الْمَسْجِدَ وَقَالَ لِلْرَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم, طُفْ, طُفْ بِالْبَيْتِ they enter into the Kaaba and everybody sees this whole gang of people roll in there, they roll in, they're rolling heavy. And they walk in there and then they basically line up. They form a little bit of a circle. Seven guys spaced out, hands on their swords. So they're all kind of like hands right there. So they all put their hands on their swords and they line up with their back towards the Kaaba, facing out towards everybody who's there. And then Mutam al Adi tells the Prophet, make tawaf for your re entry into Makkah. Of course, this is something we do till today as well. The tawaf of, you know, the, of visiting the house. When we go to Makkah, we make Umrah at the very least. And a part of that Umrah is doing tawaf of the bait, circling seven times the Kaaba. But even pre Islamically, even in Jahiliyyah, even for the Mushrik Arab, they maintained this tradition from the time of Ibrahim salam, that even when one of them, even one of the mushriks would leave Makkah and they would come back to Makkah, when they would re-enter Makkah, they would do tawaf of the bait. So maintaining even their own tradition, of course the Prophet ﷺ is doing this for the Islamic tradition, but even Mutim bin Adi as a mushrik saying, as a Makkah, this is your birthright. This is your home. You are the grandson of Abdul Muttalib. When you re-enter your home city of Mecca, you're supposed to do tawaf. So, tuf bil bayt. Ya Muhammad, circle the Kaaba. And they're all standing there, and the Prophet ﷺ does tawaf, making the dhikr and the tasbih of Allah, he makes tawaf seven times. 
I mean, he makes tawaf one time, which is seven circles. So he circles the Kaaba seven times. They spread out, circled around where the Prophet was doing tawaf. They forward like a circle around him, all holding their swords, basically keeping their hands on their swords, ready to draw at any time, ready to go. They took their safeties off, ready to go. I'm sorry about all the gun analogies. So if anybody's listening elsewhere, I'm speaking from the great state of Texas. All right? No, but not trying to be insensitive. The gun issue is a serious issue, but that's my culture. That's where I come from. So, فَأَقْبَلَ سُفْيَا أَبُو سُفْيَان إِلَى مُتْعِمْ So now Abu Sufyan, Abu Jahl, everybody sing there, kind of jaws on the floor. They had a whole plan when Muhammad comes back into Mecca, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this is what we're going to do, this is what we're going to do, then this is how we're going to handle things. Now Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa walks in, but he's got this whole like entourage, he's got this whole like security detail. And this isn't some ordinary individual, this is Mutim bin Adi. This is a leader of Mecca, leader of Quraysh. And by the way, Mutim bin Adi had a reputation for being kind of a... You know, just not being somebody who was a leader of Quraysh, like a diplomat, but he had a reputation for being able to like, you know, throw down if he needed to. He was known for his like fighting skills. That's why all seven of his sons were trained by him. So now he's got this whole like security detail, and he's doing tawaf, and what do we do now? So Abu Sufyan gets up and very peacefully, you know, kind of hands, hands up in the air, look, I'm, I'm not here to fight. He approaches Mut'im and he says to Mut'im, Amujirun am tabi'un. I'm just asking you a question. Amujirun, Amujir am tabi'un. Are you simply just giving him protection? Are you, he, are you actually following him now? I'm just asking, okay? Don't get offended, it's just a question. Are you protecting him? Or are you following him? I have to know. We gotta know where you stand. And so he says, لا بل مجير. He goes, no, 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 I don't believe in his message. That's what's very interesting about this though. He's very open up front about it. The Prophet says, I'm right there. He says, no, I don't believe in what he has to say. I don't even understand what he's talking about. I, I got no interest. But I am granting him my protection. لا بل مجير. He says, Abu Sufyan says, إذن لا تحفر. إذن لا تخفر, excuse me, إذن لا تخفر, which is basically an Arabic word, a لا ينقض عهدك, لا ينقض عهدك, إذن لا تخفر. That in that case, meaning your promise will not be violated. You made him a promise, you said you would protect him, you put your honor on the line, you gave him your word, we will not violate your promise. We will not disrespect you. Because you have to understand, violating that promise would have been disrespecting Mut'im. So he says, we will not disrespect you. You would not disrespect us, we will not disrespect you. فَجَلَ سَمَعَهُ And Abu Sufyan to show him, to make a gesture to him, that we're not here to disrespect you. Abu Sufyan said, have a seat. You can calm down, you can relax. You can take your hand off your sword. Just have a seat, right here. And I will sit with you. I will sit with you. And Mut'im sat down and Abu Sufyan sat down with him. Hatta qada Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tawafahu. Until the Prophet completed his tawaf. Falamma in sarafa in sarafu ma'ahu. Then when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left the Kaaba, left the Haram, then Mut'im and his seven sons also walked out with him. Fadahaba Abu Sufyan ila majlisihi. Abu Sufyan goes back to the gathering of all the leaders of Quraysh. Because they're all kind of like, what just happened? And he says to them, فَمَكَثَ أَيَّامْ So he basically goes back and informs them, look, Mutam is given his protection. We got to live with it. Like it or hate it. It is what it is. It is what it is. فَمَكَثَ أَيَّامًا ثُمَّ أَذِنَ لَهُ فِي الْهِجْرَةِ And then basically the narration, Abu Ishaq, excuse me, Ibn Ishaq, and uh, Alama Umawi actually mentions this in his Kitab al-Maghazi. He mentions that a few days, then the days passed on, and eventually the time came, a couple of years later, when the Prophet ﷺ made the migration, made the hijrah from Makkah to Medina. 
فلما هاجر رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم للمدينة توفي المطعم بن عدي بعد يسير After the Prophet ﷺ migrated from Makkah to Medina, Mutar bin Adi had not accepted Islam, still not had not believed. Shortly after the Prophet ﷺ left Makkah and went to Medina, he got the news that Mutar bin Adi passed away. He died, natural causes, he passed away. When the Prophet ﷺ received the news, he announced it, that a man who was not a believer, he didn't believe, But he did show us support and even kindness. He has passed away. Hassan bin Thabit, one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, who was a great poet. And in fact, the way I like to call it is the Prophet ﷺ's personal poet on demand. Whenever the Prophet ﷺ required poetry, he would tell Hassan bin Thabit. And Hassan bin Thabit radiallahu anhu would, you know, com- he would basically compose some poetry. For whatever purpose or maqsad, the Prophet ﷺ needed it. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ had established a podium in the masjid, off to the side from the member of the Prophet ﷺ. That was a special place where that whenever the Prophet ﷺ did ask Hassan bin Thabit to compose some poetry, that Hassan bin Thabit would go and from that podium would recite that poetry. So Hassan bin Thabit says to the Prophet ﷺ, Wallahi, that I swear by Allah, la ar. لَأَرْثِيَنَّهُ That I will say a few words to basically mark, to commemorate the death of Mutim bin Adi. Basically, I will write his obituary. I will write an obituary for Mutim bin Adi in poetry. And he says this, and the Prophet did not object to it. It's very, very important. You have to understand, see there are some things about Nubu'ah, when you study in a book of Aqidah, you learn certain things, that from the, the, the station of Nubu'ah, part of the responsibility of a Nabi or Rasul, is that they cannot tolerate anything being done that is incorrect, that is wrong. It is a part of their responsibility, it's like an oath that they take. The oath of Nubu'ah requires them, that if somebody says something, one of their followers, one of their companions, says something or does something, and they have knowledge of it, that this is incorrect, it is part of their responsibility, that they have to say, no, this is not correct. Kindly, generously, graciously, of course, lovingly, of course. With hikmah, with wisdom, mawa'idatil hasana, etc., etc. But they do put an end to it. It is mandatory upon them. It is a part of like their, their spiritual DNA. They have to. Hassan bin Thabit, when the Prophet ﷺ informs everyone, Mutayr bin Adi has passed away, Hassan bin Thabit says, I will, I will talk about him. I will write an obituary for him. And the Prophet ﷺ does not object to it. He allows him to do so. And not only does Hassan bin Thabit write this, but Hassan bin Thabit then basically reads this, recites this. And the Prophet ﷺ allows him to. And I have the entire um, thing here, basically, the, 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 po- the poem that he wrote for, um, you know, marking the passing of him. He says, Aya Ainun. فَأَبْكَى سَيِّدَ الْقَوْمِ وَاسْفَحِي بِدَمْعٍ وَإِنْ أَنْزَفْتَهُ فَاسْكَبْكَى الدِّمَاء وَبَكَى عَظِيمُ الْمُشْعِرِينَ كِلَيْهِمَا عَلَى النَّاسِ مَعْرُوفًا لَهُ مَا ما تكلم فلو كان مجد يخلد الدهر واحدة من الناس أبقى مجده اليوم مطعما أجرت رسول الله منهم فأصبحوا عبيدك ما لبا It's, it's kind of complex and stuff, but the one line that I do want to translate here that's very interesting. He says, أَجَرْتَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ سَلَامَ مِنْهُمْ He says, you amongst all the believers and everyone, amongst the people, you granted your protection to Muhammad Rasulullah صَلَى اللَّهِ سَلَامَ فَأَصْبَحُوا عَبِيدَكَ And because of the kindness, the honor, the dignity, that you showed towards the, the honor that you showed in dealing with the Prophet ﷺ, the believers have become slaves to you. Meaning the believers are indebted to you. We as believers are indebted to you, ya mut'im. You are not a believer, but we are indebted to you. 
Because you granted protection. You showed support for Muhammad Rasulullah who is more beloved to us than even our own families are. He said these words. And the Prophet ﷺ did not object to any of this. Not only that, but the narration actually tells us that later on, long, uh, a, a few years, a couple of years later, after Mutar bin had passed away, Mutar bin Adi, after he had passed away, the Battle of Badr occurs. The Battle of Badr happens. The first all-out, full-scale, major battle. There were a few skirmishes, Saraya before that. But the first major, full-scale, all-out battle occurs between the believers, between the Muslims in Medina and the Mushrikun, the Quraysh of Mecca. At the place of Badr, at the wells of Badr. And the Muslims, of course, are granted victory by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the battle of Badr. And 70 plus of the Quraysh are taken as prisoners of war by the Muslims, by the believers. They're taken as prisoners. The Prophet of Allah when he sat down with the Sahaba radiallahu anhum to counsel, to convene the council as to what should we do with the prisoners that we've received. The, the eventual decision is that their families can send ransom for them and ransom them or that these prisoners themselves can teach Muslim children how to read and write. And 10 Muslim kids how to read and write, and they'll be set free. But the Prophet ﷺ at that council, he actually said, and this is recorded in authentic narrations. Imam Bukhari mentions this hadith, this narration. That the Prophet of Allah ﷺ said, regarding the Usara of Badr, the prisoners of war from the Battle of Badr, لَوْ كَانَ الْمُتْعِمْ بِنْ عَدِي حَيًّا that if Mutim bin Adi was still alive today, ثُمَّ سَأَلَنِي فِي هَؤُلَاءِ النَّتْنَى And he would have asked me in regards to these people, he said, لَوَهَبْتُهُمْ لَهُ As a gift to Mutim bin Adi, I would have released all of them. I would have released all these prisoners into his custody. I would have handed all of them over, no questions asked, as a gift to Mutim bin Adi. لَوَهَبْتُهُمْ لَهُ as a gift to him. That's how much respect the Prophet ﷺ had for Muta bin Adi. That's how much he remembered the kindness, the gesture that was given, shown by Muta bin Adi towards the Prophet ﷺ. And there are many, many profound lessons here. And a lot of very important, relevant lessons for us who live as a minority, amongst the Muslim majority. Look, we have to understand what we believe is and what we believe in. We have no doubts about that. We, have, we need to have no lack of conviction about what we believe is in the truth. The Qur'an is the truth. Muhammad is a messenger of Allah. This is our deen. Deen is Islam. This is our deen. This is what we believe in. And yes, our primary relationship is through iman. Muslim brothers and sisters, they are our iman, our, our faith, our family of faith. But our deen and our iman does not require us to have an adversarial relationship with anyone and everyone who does not believe exactly what we believe in. And the Prophet ﷺ's relationship with Mutim bin Adi is a perfect illustration of that fact. This is someone the Prophet ﷺ reaches out to. We have a situation we think you can help. Extending, asking for help and assistance. To a non-Muslim, this, this, this mindset that exists to quite an extent within the Muslim community, and especially for Muslims who come from countries where the majority of the population is Muslim, are Muslim, this is a very confusing issue. This is a very, very confusing issue. Because they feel like, well, how do we handle this? They're not Muslim, they're not... We don't have that relationship of iman with them. How do we manage our relationship with them? What, what is the nature of our relationship with them? But we see here, Muhammad Rasulullah is the standard. Not the culture in Pakistan or in Morocco or Egypt. That is not the standard. Muhammad Rasulullah is the standard. The seerah is the standard. The Quran and the sunnah is the standard. And the Prophet of Allah is reaching out to Mutamin Adi, talking to him, asking for his help and his assistance.
And we see that there will always be people like Abu Jahal who will oppose and persecute, but there will also be people who maybe won't. This is the other thing. They guess our goal and objective is to share the truth of Islam with everyone. But there's also this consciousness, this awareness that maybe someone will not believe or does not believe. But that does not change the fact that they still don't wish well for us, that they don't want good for us. And we are open to that reality. Mutim bin Adi did not believe, did not accept. But he did support, he did help. And at the end of the day, the Prophet ﷺ did not forget his kindness, remembered his kindness and even spoke of it fondly. And was willing to show him a gesture of respect that was shown to him, to the Prophet ﷺ by Mutim bin Adi. So a very powerful lesson about us and how we need to be managing our relationship as a community with the majority that we live amongst. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to practice everything that was said and heard. Subhanallahi wa bihamdihi. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta. Nasaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.